Welcome back to Shifting Schools. I'm so excited to bring you today's episode where I get to sit down and talk to Peter Steepleman, the 2021 Missouri Superintendent of the Year. He is now a full-time consultant. He's just released a book called The Imperfect Leader. His website is all about human-centered leadership and he's also got a non podcast by the same name, An Imperfect Leader. In today's episode, we talk, you're going to guess it, about leadership, about school leadership at all levels. Peter really focuses in on this idea of how do we become a hu human-centered leadership models? What does that mean for schools? What does that mean for an, an organization? And you get to walk away with some tips around what he calls is the three pillar approach to a transformational model. And these three entry points are collective aspiration, nested patterns, and leaders learning work. He explains more about that in our podcast. It's such a great episode of in-depth learning, and you're going to want to check out his podcast, An Imperfect Leader. We talk about that as well. This is a fantastic one. If you are in any leadership role from coaching to educator in your classroom where you are a leader, all the way up to school board members and superintendents, we cover it all in this episode of Shifting Schools. And with that, on with the show. All right. Welcome back to Shifting Schools. I'm excited to be here with Peter Steepleman, the 2021 Missouri Superintendent of the Year. Congratulations on that, Peter. You know, I appreciate you saying that because um, my the announcement and the award ceremony was done in my conference room with everybody six feet apart from each other. You know, oh, because my it was gosh. the height of the pandemic. And so it was yeah. like, we're here to recognize. And so thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Peter has a book out called An Imperfect Leader. He runs the website Human Centered Leaders and has a podcast, An Imperfect Leader. Peter, give us a little bit about your background and kind of what you're doing today. Yeah, so uh, I'm uh, a, a retired superintendent who has sort of shifted into advising and consulting. And um, But before that, I was a superintendent in Columbia, Missouri, in the Midwest, fourth largest district in the state. And before that, you know, sort of followed your traditional path of a teacher and a principal and, a, and then central office. Before I was in Columbia, Missouri, I was in Oakland, California as a teacher and an administrator. And before that, I was an insurance agent. So um, that was kind of a, a, a very quick and abrupt shift when I realized that's not <laughs> what I wanted to be doing. And all of a sudden you found your educational path and uh, exactly. the rest it was of one of those like drop everything and read days. And so, oh, I went yeah. To, <laughs> yeah. so I went into a classroom and read a book that my in-laws had written uh, called the, the beggar's magic. And it was like, it was, it was a transformational moment, sort of like looking at these kids who were sort of wide eyed and, and totally into the story and asking you a million questions. And uh, I went back to my cubicle um, and said, yeah, this is not really where, where I want to be. Uh, very cool. Very cool. Well, I want to get started today with our conversation around your website is titled Human Centered Leaders and talk a little bit about what is a human centered leadership approach. How do you emphasize the value of people first? And could you maybe elaborate on how this philosophy differs from maybe a traditional top down leadership model uh, as it impacts organizational culture? Yeah, I really appreciate the question. I think, first of all, it's important to recognize um, that there's a difference between reform and transformation. And so many mm -hmm. of our schools and school districts across the nation have adopted a real like reform sort of movement. And reform mm -hmm. is like, is really about changing, allowing external forces to change what's happening in your system. And so it sort of focuses on what's going wrong, right? We got to mm -hmm. fix something and it's, it's giving orders and it's coaching for compliance and it's um, and it's a lot of high pressure. And so those mm. who are listening right now are probably feeling uneasy because reform is what that makes us all feel. It's just sort of this high anxiety and, and frustration. Transformation and human-centered transformation in particular is very different. It says 
what do we want to create together? So it starts mm. with this sort of collective aspiration and creating that, that shared purpose. And, and then it sort of says, well, let's not look at what's not going well. Let's look at it through a more appreciative lens. What's going well and how do we get more of it? And then let's use curiosity and innovation sort of questions and inquiry to sort of gauge and sort of guide us towards where we want to be. You have these cycles of inquiry and saying, you know, if it's going well, great. If it's not going well, let's evaluate, make some mid-course corrections. And instead of coaching for compliance, let's do peer coaching where we share the load together and learn from each other and then redefine the goal if that's necessary. So human-centered leadership is all about, you know, the people in your organization, not not process necessarily. And so for me, it's sort of the antithesis of what Frederick Taylor came with when he designed schools and factories. And, you know, the only institutions that are still following Frederick Taylor's um, sort of efficiency model are prisons and schools. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to do is is really rethink that and, and engage in high levels of collaboration and shared leadership and and this notion of harvesting the collective wisdom of the people in your organization, leaders at every level. So it's somewhat dismantling the hierarchy, recognizing there has to be one in certain sure. circumstances. But when you're making decisions, making them together. And I love this idea of talking about reform versus transformation, because just as you're saying that, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that's all I'm hearing in the news is we've got learning loss due to COVID and our math scores are down and it's automatically putting our frame set into this. We've got to do something to like the wheels are falling off. How do we fix it? Right. And we, right. And, and what you read and what you hear all the time is we've got to fix things. We've got to fix things. We've got to fix things. And that puts you into a a, a mindset of anxiousness, a mindset of, I don't know what to do, or I don't know how to fix it. I don't know how we got here right. versus that transformational student or human centered approach of what do we want to do together? I yes. And how do we want to be together? Right. I mean, I so that. this notion of like establishing some protocols and, and behaviors and habits that we'll do together. And I think you, you bring something up that's pretty important, which is that, um, and having worked in a metropolitan district in Oakland, California, you know, we were constantly being approached with external forces telling us about how they're going to fix our teaching, how yeah. they're going to fix our kids. And it's so problematic to yeah. not have trust in the professionals in your, in your system to say, no, no, we recognize that there was learning loss. We recognize that there are issues in terms of kids being able to collaborate well together and be able to talk to each other because they've had to be thrust into, you know, technology only sure. as opposed to technology assisted. And, mm. and so let's do this work together as opposed to, um, you know, allowing someone else to tell us, here's your, here's your silver bullet. It has never worked over a hundred years, but yeah, all of tell a sudden, me about now it. it's going to work. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's so true. You know, and I think this is one of the things I talk about a lot when I'm consulting and I'm sure you do too, is education is the hardest. It's the hardest thing to try to change because everybody's gone through it in America. Everybody's gone through it, whether you were successful or not, we can debate that all day, but everyone <laughs> has an experience, <laughs> right? Of, of this educational system. And so when we're trying to make transformational moves, it's really difficult because everybody remembers their experience. And then that experience and everyone had one, everyone had one, whether it was good or yes. bad, everyone had that experience. And one of the things that I like is, uh, you know, through your website and your book an imperfect leader, you talk about building strong partnerships and you advocate for strong partnerships between leaders, school boards, and the larger community. What strategies do you maybe recommend for developing and maintaining these very crucial partnerships, especially in the, in the era we find ourselves in right now? Yeah. You, you know, you bring up something that I think is interesting. There's a difference between complicated and complex. And mm -hmm. um, when we say things like, well, it's not rocket science. We're like, yeah, I know schools are more complex than that. Right. There's no yeah, one right. answer, even if it's a difficult <laughs> way to get there. Complex is so there is no right answer necessarily. Mm -hmm. And you're constantly trying different ways to get at what you're trying to achieve. And so building partnerships is a big part of that. And I like to, I like to use metaphor and I think of schools as like an organism. And in order for an organism to thrive, like its internal structures, its systems, its habits, they have to be really healthy. And the external systems outside that are, are, are sort of influencing the school district or a school system or a school in, 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 you know, particular, they have to be healthy as well in terms of being able to support and, and nurture that system. So, mm. 
Um, so you asked about like some strategies. Before I tell you a strategy, I, I'd like to suggest maybe some um, some habits of, or at least some ways of thinking about things. So obviously constant communication, right? But mm. clarity, not transparency. That's one mm. that I learned from Avis Williams, a wildly and, 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 and brilliant superintendent in New Orleans. And she taught me two things. Well, she taught me many things, but two things that really stuck out. One is clarity versus transparency. She says that not everybody wants to know every detail that went into making a decision, but they want clarity yeah. to know that you're really clear on the why and that there are some yeah. really the, some of the details are made really uh, abundantly clear. So clarity mm -hmm. versus transparency. And the other is that if you can buy into something, you can be bought out. So she mm. talks about commitment instead of buying into something. So, so for me, it's like, oh, and then a third for me is um, seeking advice, not feedback. Mm. So mm. during the pandemic, we were constantly asking for feedback, which was misinterpreted as asking for a vote. And so yeah. when we would ask about, you know, give us some feedback about your thoughts on masks or give us your feedback about our return plan. It became yeah. this vote and then this, this sort of chorus that said, mm. we voted for this. And my thought was, oh, no, I was asking for advice because I'm yeah. also seeking advice from virologists and pediatric infectious disease experts and, yeah. and, and the health department that is also offering some really important advice. So to get back to your question about building mm. stronger partnerships, first, I think that language matters and, and those types of things. And then the second piece for me is um, really engaging in things like a world cafe. Because you're seeking advice, you're you're bringing people together, and you're asking a, a very big question, and you don't ask many. You just ask for one big question, and individuals are sitting at different tables, and sort of wrestling with that question, and writing their thoughts down on on paper, and talking with their people at their table. Um, sometimes it's really wise to have students and mm. teachers and and school board members be facilitators, so that they're really quietly listening to what the community is saying. They'll have their yeah. time and their opportunity to give their feedback or <laughs> their advice as well. And then you ask them to change tables. So they get to hear from different perspectives. And then you collect all that information. And then you say, before we were to, before we're going to share this out with others, we're going to then make sure that we really consider the perspectives that are not seated here today, because mm. you make decisions with the people most impacted by that decision. And so if in fact you're talking about, I don't know, closing a school, well, you have to make sure that you're engaging so many different parts of your community and, and your system before you actually release or reveal some of your thoughts about moving forward. And so I say a world cafe is a, a super important one. And then since you, um, I know you are somebody that all across the nation, we seek, uh, your, your counsel and your, your expertise around technology. There's a tool called a thought exchange that I've used and is amazing because what it allows you to do, it uses Bayesian averages to sort of eliminate the loud voice and mm. elevate uh, really what your community is saying. And then using AI, something I know that you are really at the forefront <laughs> and leading, <laughs> that that it, it uses AI to sort of mine the information about what people are saying. And then it gives you information about potentially um, two different camps. This group thinks this thing, you know, this, this group thinks this way. Um, mm. And it allows you to then say, but here's what they have in common. Here's mm. where they have common ground. And for a leader, it allows you to then say, okay, through all this cacophony, I'm going to sort of delve into and look for where there's common ground. And I'm going to start there because that's going to mm. build for me the most, um, the, the greatest partnerships and, in, 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 and allow me to lead. I love that. Build from a common ground. Uh, I mean, I think that's such great advice for leaders at, at all levels. I know I think a lot of what I'm hearing and seeing in schools that I visit is just the stress that teachers are under, uh, that stress that yeah. that uh, school leaders are under. Uh, there's just a lot of stress in the system right now. And I think that idea of how do we how do we find what common ground is and build build from there rather than where we usually end up and where it feels like a lot of times is we end up on two opposite ends of a spectrum and you're trying to navigate, negotiate, I don't know, pick your word no, of what you're, you're trying so to right. do. Yeah. <laughs> you well, know. you think about those beginning of the year meetings and mm. there's such excitement and optimism and you do engage in sort of, um, sort of this collective aspiration. What do we want to create together? What are we going to do this year? And by the time November comes, you're yeah. looking back and you're like, 
what were we talking about? God, I'm exhausted, yeah. <laughs> right? And then February is like the darkest month. Yeah, and it's right. like, don't even mention those back to school meetings. And then yeah. May comes and you want to sort of come back together and say, look at what we achieved. And everyone's just like, I would rather do something else, you know? Yeah. Um, and so how do you find that common ground and then have these cycles of inquiry to celebrate what you have achieved and recognize like we are marching towards something mm. really great together. And to your point, the pandemic has forced us into this, re yeah, we're, we're burnt out. I mean, across the nation, yeah. if I went to visit some schools last week in the Bay Area, in the South Bay, in Silicon Valley, most notably because I was really interested to see um, these are schools that adopted a no cell phone policy. And so I was kind mm. of interested to see how, you know, what are teachers saying? What are kids saying in terms of uh, being able to maximize their learning? And mm -hmm. um, to your point, though, there is this sort of low hum of, of we're really tired. And they yeah. haven't fully reset to say, what do we want to create together? How do we want to be together? You know, establish mm -hmm. a compelling purpose. Mm. Did they find anything about the cell phones on a separate note? Well, yes. So um, it's interesting. I asked some eighth graders, uh, tell me a little bit about you know, the, the cell phones. And they said, well, we're not allowed to have them. And I said, what do you think about that? And I said, what's good about it? He goes, we hate it. I said, okay, I'm going to get to what, what do you hate about it? <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you like about it? And it was, you know, it was very simple, like, well, I'm able to hold on to my phone because in this case, uh, this is a school that adopted uh, a program by Yonder. And so they have these mm. pouches, they put them in and they get to maintain sure. possession, which is pretty cool. Um, I said, okay, what don't you like about it? Well, I'm not allowed to have my phone and I want to have my phone. I said, mm. so you're eighth graders. Yes. Your school started doing this when you were in sixth grade. Yes. What was sixth grade like? Oh, it was terrible. Kids were yeah. always arguing with teachers. Kids were recording fights. Kids were nonstop on their phones. Their parents, our parents were texting us. So we didn't know whether or not we should answer our phone and, you know, answer our yeah. parent who's texting or get in trouble with our teacher. And now yeah. we don't have that. I said, mm. so it sounds like you can learn more. And they said, well, yeah, yeah. I said, so it doesn't sound so bad. And he goes, no, it's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, yeah. kids are pretty honest. You know, they don't like the yeah, fact that yeah. they don't have possession, you know, fully. Sure. But they also recognize that nobody does. You know, everybody yeah. is participating. And I was in the lunchroom. And that was the best because yeah. it reminded me of the days when I was an elementary school principal where we would say to kids, you're at a level five. You know, it's so loud in here. You're at yeah. a level five. We need you back at a level two. And yeah. that's what it was in this cafeteria. Kids were talking to each other, laughing joking yeah. they weren't on their phones and that was pretty neat yeah yeah that's cool that's very cool well that's awesome we could do a whole nother podcast just on that for <laughs> I'm, sure. I'm all on uh, it yeah yeah uh one of the things over on your website and a lot of the stuff you talk about is the transformational model this your human-centered school transformation model yeah and it includes three entry points you have your collective aspiration your nestled uh, patterns and leaders learning work can maybe uh, explain a little bit about these different components and how do they work together to deepen the the culture of learning in a school yeah, thanks. I really appreciate it. My uh, my mentor Linda Henke created this model and um and I now get to be the beneficiary of it and and my hope is to be able to share it with others because mm. you know when I was a superintendent I led um through relationship mostly um and mm. particularly in those early years uh, sort of made decisions intuitively and it wasn't until I learned about this model that I had something really to anchor myself to so research backed in the sense of you know things like a growth mindset and Carol Dweck's work or or mm -hmm. compelling purpose and and systems thinking is like Peter um uh, Sen Senge's work. And so, um, it, so this model starts with sort of at the core is what you want in all of our schools is deeper learning, but deeper leading and deeper learning and deeper learning really speaks to the teacher serving as that activator of knowledge and, sure. and doing project based or place based learning where kids are able to follow what they're curious about, something that is tied to their community and be able to then learn about it and then talk about it in a meaningful way that's, you know, that they're learning their standards, but in a way that makes sense to them and is relevant. And so that's at the mm. center. And then there are three ways to get in there as, as you described. And sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I describe it as that like they, they serve as like trailheads when you go camping. And I only mm -hmm. laugh because I grew up on Long Island. I didn't do a lot of camping. And then when I started dating now my wife, she wanted to go camping all the time and and uh, we would like wake up and all of our food would have been eaten. You know, she'd say like, oh, yeah. my God, I, like I had a terrible <laughs> dream that all of our food was eaten. And then, of course, <laughs> it all had been eaten. So maybe trailheads is not the best, <laughs> the best. <laughs> but but 
Collective aspiration. You can enter anywhere uh, on this to, to get to deeper learning. Collective aspiration is really like the heart of the work that we do. Mm. So it does ask for you to kind of consider your, your compelling purpose. Why do we exist and what are we trying to achieve for children? And how do we make sure that we're all on the same page for that? Um, and then nested patterns is really the muscle of the work. So it, it really speaks to the habits that we, mm. that we, um, practice as an organization. So how do we want to be together? So that high levels of collaboration and shared leadership and uh, empathy and compassion, uh, creativity is in curiosity speaks to like innovation. Um, and then the last is that leaders learning work, which speaks to the mind of the work. And so mm -hmm. that we serve as lead learners, which is really Brene Brown's work on being vulnerable. So admit mm -hmm. when you've made a mistake, make a mid course correction and move together, you know, move on. But it also means learning alongside your people. So uh, you do so many um, trainings and workshops and, and you work um, not just one, one offs, but do, you know, over time with schools, which I think yeah. is so important. And I'm sure you notice when you're doing that work, if the leader has just sent a team of teachers, go do that work. That's important. Yeah. Work. You go do it. That that doesn't become um, enduring change for or transformation within their system. So when they're agree. doing that work with their teachers alongside, um, that's pretty magical. So the leader's learning work is about serving as a lead learner, but then also applying systems thinking to that work. So really recognizing you know, I'm going to make this decision and there's possibly going to be a delay between making the decision and getting the results I want. Mm. So how are we going to manage that tension? And so having those conversations about, about systems thinking, if, if you ever uh, want to learn more about uh, systems thinking in particular and in schools, the water center for systems thinking is like a magnificent resource mm. for, for school leaders and teachers. That's great. You'll have to send me that link. We'll make sure we I will. put that They're in the show amazing. notes. They're amazing. They're really amazing. Yeah, that'd be great. And I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, the, the amount of trainings um, that we've done through the years, you know, when we do a long-term or when I do a long-term contract uh, with school districts, one of the things I always include is the school leaders need to be going through the training with the teachers. Yes. And of course, I mean, as a consultant, I can say it all day. Whether or not the leaders actually show up says so much about the organization. And to your point, in the school districts where I've had a three or five year long relationship with and the either principal or superintendent or, you know, uh, assistant superintendent of teaching and learning, they are in every single training. They are there with the teachers. They are hearing the conversations. They are asking for advice. They are able to put out the plans. Those districts every single time move faster, yeah. are more smoother in transition. Yeah. They just versus districts. And I've had quite a few of them where the principal just doesn't have time to come or, right. and you know, they're not making it a priority or there isn't any leadership. And so I end up with a group of teachers who are asking questions of the district and of course, I can't answer them because I'm right. not part of the district and there's right. nobody there to support them in, okay, we're learning to do this. We're learning project-based learning or we're learning, you know, a, a hybrid approach uh, to, to teaching and learning with online courses. Where, what does this mean for us as a school? And, and there's, they're not in the conversation in the moment. And it's so, so critical when right. you're trying to create transformational change that you have to be in it as a community you know, from, from, from leaders, from leaders at every level, all the way down. It's just incredible like how snapping, the difference I've seen. Clapping and uh, so I'm looking for the emoji for I can to <laughs> celebration. Yeah, you're so right. And there's such a difference between the districts such where everybody is doing that work together and those who are just sent to go, you know, yeah. you know and they call it, we're, well, we're doing train the trainer. No, you're not. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I mean, just thinking just now reflecting on it, I mean, I've got the districts that I have the most to success with wasn't anything because of what I was doing as a consultant. It was because of the leadership at that district. Yeah. Well, you were serving as an activator. I mean, that's yeah. deeper learning, right? Yeah. You're, you could call it facilitator, but I think it's deeper than that. You weren't just facilitating conversation. You are an expert and you're then activating for them what this could look like for them. Because yeah. it's true, most districts are very similar, but there are some pieces that are distinct in every community. And so yeah. you're serving as an activator. Yeah, I love that. We're having a conversation here with Peter Steepleman, who've also written a book, An Imperfect Leader. Talk a little bit about the book. What was the inspiration behind it? And where could people go and maybe get a copy? 
Yeah. So um, I my superintendency ended in 2021. I had indicated to my board in 2019 that I was going to be moving out of Missouri. And um, and so I moved to the Pacific Northwest and that was always our plan. And of course the pandemic hit and they were like, are you sure you want to leave? I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I got us through. I got us back in seat. Take yeah. Care. Take care now. Um, <laughs> and so I really wanted to process what I had learned. Everything mm. from um, this model of a human centered uh, school transformational model. I wanted to be able to think about and talk about systems thinking, everything I'd learned or was learning through that work. And then I wanted to apply an after action review process, which is something that is somewhat foreign to school leaders. Although, you know, to some extent we do this, we say, you know, that went well, or that didn't go so well, or this is what I would probably do differently in the future. Mm. But I wanted a very structured approach in this book to sort of look at one big issue from each of my seven years as a superintendent and sort of look back on them and say, okay, so what got overlooked and what did I learn about relationships and what frustrated me? And you know what, what could I have done differently? And also in the end, because I learned so much through this experience, what was something that was good that came out of it? Mm. And so my publisher wouldn't let me write it as a memoir. So it's about a superintendent. <laughs> but it's me. Um, so you're like, if you're a reader going, God, every chapter is a guy, you know, like, yeah, well, it's, it's me. So, yeah. um, and, um, and there's a distinction between imperfect and incompetent. So I recognize that I'm mm. being incredibly vulnerable by just highlighting something that just didn't go so well in each of those years. And the mm. goal was somewhat to be like, um, you know, somewhat cathartic for me to sort of relive and, and to sort of reflect on what happened, but also to try to have an impact on those who are aspiring to be school or district leaders, uh, those who are becoming school board members and trying to understand how superintendents think and the different ways that they interact within their system and the external system, because you're mm -hmm. in many ways, you're a politician as well as a CEO, sure. as, as well as a lead learner. Um, yeah. And so I wanted to have an impact on those who are aspiring, those who are new to the profession, and then those who have been doing it for some time to know that they're not alone in, in some of their experiences. Um, so I talked about big issues that most superintendents, you know, will face everything from, um, there's a chapter about, um, uh, LGBTQ plus uh, community within the schools, the gay straight Alliance wanting to put up posters in a school and how that, um, went well in some areas and didn't go so well in other areas. And mm. how did you sort of navigate a conservative community? That's an important piece right now in our, in our country to sort of, sort of figure out and navigate. And so I share some lessons learned what went well, what didn't go so well, or mm. how do you bring values to your organization? You know, and so I brought these values and I thought, you know, these are really great values. And then things weren't going so well with um, within the organization. And I remember leaning on a principal and saying, we've got these values. And she said, no, no, those are your values. They're not our <laughs> values. I was like, oh, my God. So <laughs> how do you go through a process of saying, yeah. how do we want to be together? Right. What yeah. are our values as an organization? And boy, I'm so glad that we did that work because during the pandemic, they were essential. They buoyed yeah. us when things were really rough. Mm. I love that. And people can get the book anywhere. Oh, yeah. I, Sorry. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Anywhere, yeah. everywhere. Amazon and Barnes and Noble. And um, when I, you know, I'm feeling like, does anyone care about the book? You know, I look and say like, oh, well, you can get it anywhere. So yeah, that's an great. imperfect leader, human centered leadership in after action, because it's really about looking back, you know, hospitals and the military do this regularly. And I really mm. think that superintendents, if they gave themselves just a little bit of time to do this with their teams, would make much more predictably successful decisions. Mm. Now, on top of that, you've started the podcast by the same right. name, an imperfect yeah. leader. Right. Uh, yeah. Talk a little bit about it because uh, and really you know, creative. I was a, I was a <laughs> yeah. Uh, I uh, we had the same conversation for your podcast as we're doing podcast swaps right. here. Yeah. Uh, so appreciate appreciate that. And that uh, I had somebody you. who who has listens to your podcast, and they said. I can't wait to listen to that episode because Peter's podcast is all about, you know, looking back and reflecting on you as a leader and something that you did. And, and Jeff, you're all about the future and where are we going? They said, exactly. Well, tough. I think, you know, when my, when, when <laughs> our episode airs, the one where you are on my podcast, I think I declared you are a futurist. Meanwhile, I yeah. do a retrospective. <laughs> what did you learn? Yeah. And you're saying that's interesting and important because it'll certainly help me think about where I am right now. Yeah. And now I take people to look where we're going and that's pretty yeah. cool. 
Well, and I really appreciate it. And I'd like you to talk about the format of your podcast because as someone that was on the inner on the interviewer or interviewee side of it, um, I really appreciated the thoughtfulness of being reflective. Uh and maybe talk about that. Just like what is the what's the premise and, and how sure. you set up the show. So the premise is similar to how I described the book. And uh, what I do is um, there are really amazing leaders all over our country that I either find out about or, or read about. And I reach out to them and say, you know, I wonder if we could talk about the article you wrote or, or mm-hmm. the work that you're doing. And so that's the first part of the episode is just to sort of learn about that leader and the way that they think. And then the second part is to ask them to do exactly what I did in the book, which is to reflect on a decision they made and what they learn about it. And I interject from time to time to say, so what got overlooked? Or Mm. if I understand correctly, it sounds like this is what happened. And sometimes I say, Mm. yes, you're exactly right. Or no, that's not exactly what I was thinking, which is helpful because it clarifies for them. What were they thinking at that moment? And um, so there have been some great episodes with like, um, with, with individuals who really talk about what they've learned and, and in some cases how they lost their job and moved to another one based on a decision that they made. And so some of them are really personal and I'm grateful that they're willing to share their stories with, with a, a community. Mm-hmm. If you were to ask me like why you did the book, why do you need a podcast? For me, I, I started to think about how do we impact leader longevity? So mm. nationwide, and I'm sure you've seen this, you've started a contract with a district only to finish your contract with a different superintendent in place Yeah, because the, the, the national average for superintendents is three years. And yeah, then wow. if you're a woman or a leader of color, it's about two years. Uh, wow. And so what I wanted to do was to have some type of positive impact on leader longevity. Let us hear from people in the field who look like you, who may have walked in similar shoes, who may not look like you and have and may have had different experiences mm. and what we might each learn from their experiences as we're confronted with those decisions. So there's um, like in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, Leslie Torres Rodriguez talks about closing a school and how deeply personal mm. that was because she grew up in that school district. Yeah. She went to the Hartford Public Schools and now was having to talk to her community about declining enrollment and having to close a school and being able to tell the story about what that might mean for improved programming, even though that's really hard to lose your neighborhood school. There are yeah. districts all across America right now faced with those types of decisions yeah. that just listening to that podcast episode might give them some ideas on how to harvest that the wisdom of their community and 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 who they might be um you know missing in the conversation mm. for a new listener who maybe is uh, quickly pulling up their spotify or apple oh, yes. podcast app and, and apple looking five for stars five stars please. yeah <laughs> getting an imperfect leader all lined up uh right. do you have an episode that you recommend that you're like man if you had to start with one episode mm-hmm. on my podcast here, here's one that I would recommend, uh, this one by this person, or is there one yeah. that comes to mind that you're like, this would be well, your, your one to get started? I would say it depends on what, you know, for, I, I would push back a little bit to say like, you might be a leader who's thinking, oh my God, we made a bad hire. And now I don't mm. know what to do about that. And so, or how do I avoid, I'm about to hire someone, but I, my spidey senses or my re, a little yeah. red flag is saying, I'm not totally sure this is the right person. Should I wait? And so like Brent Elliott in Washington, DC, Dr. Elliott would say, you should probably wait. <laughs> and uh, if you're a district that's saying, um, look, we're, we're probably going to go out for a bond or a tax increase to build some buildings. And I really mm. want to kind of think that through. Mike Redmond in Minnesota, it would be a great episode. Um, Sharonica Hardin was, is in University City in Missouri and, and outside of St. Louis. And she would say, yes, there's a sense of urgency as you're coming into the position that you want to do really well. But yeah. really resist the urge to make, to be impulsive by saying things like, we don't do that, or why don't we do that? Or, you know, <laughs> to really be, to really get a beat yeah. on the system before you make a decision. Yeah. But my favorite episode still, I think, because it's just so wild, is uh, Nate Levinson was a superintendent outside of Boston in a okay. uh, town and gown community, right? So half the community belonged to different faculties of all the different prestigious universities in the Boston sure. area. And other half of the town had been there. Their roots run deep. They're not affiliated with higher ed. And the board was mostly made up of, of um, university folks. And five out of the six or six out of the seven of the board members said, you know, we have a real problem with the um, crossing guards here. They They don't, They don't come out of their cars when it rains. They they don't even show up when it snows and they're not even monitoring the most dangerous crosswalks. And so he had someone come do a traffic study 
and they came and looked and they said, uh, Nate, your traffic, your crossing guards don't get out of the cars when it rains. And uh, we were there on snow days. They're not even showing up. And you know what? They're not really at the most dangerous crosswalk. So he gave a presentation to the board and the board voted on his recommendation to eliminate the crossing guards. I think it would have saved the district maybe $60,000. And he said within just a few months, he was fired. (laughs) Oh, wow. <laughs> he said it didn't matter that he had closed achievement gaps between special education yeah. students and, and, and general education. So it didn't matter that he increased graduation rates or that he, yeah. uh, you know, uh, improved achievement. Um, it is now the only, as, as far as we know, uh, unionized crossing guard unit in the entire nation because wow. he's, so the lesson learned was really get a beat on your system and really learn what is important to a community because could you imagine the drumbeat at the board meetings where yeah. our kids are going to die or yeah. I've known this crossing guard since I was a child. She walked yeah. me across. Right. So, um, so these are compelling stories that our leaders across the nation are telling mostly because they want to have, uh, be a resource to the field. Awesome. I love that. Those are some great recommendations. Again, you can find his podcast, uh, Peter Stiepelman's podcast, An Imperfect Leader, book by the same name. Website is Human Centered Leadership. We will have links to all of that over in the show notes. Peter, thank you so much for taking time today. Uh, Are there any other places you want people to reach out and maybe connect with you? Where do you spend your time on social media or is it a good place for people to to contact you? Yeah. So I'm, I'm regularly on LinkedIn sort of, you know, giving my thoughts on things um, from time to time on Twitter. And um, I am on Instagram sometimes when I visit a school or there's something, uh, a small clip that I really want to share that I've heard something that I thought might entice you or, or at least uh, inspire you to think differently about school. So you can find me in some of those social media areas. Uh, PeterSuplin.com is, uh, is my website. And, uh, but please, you know, I'd love to hear what you think about the podcast. So if you listen and have some thoughts, would love for you to leave a review. Awesome. Well, thank you, Peter. Appreciate it. It's so great even to uh, be able to uh, interview somebody in my own backyard. Uh, We're only a ferry ride apart. That's right. Uh, People here in Seattle might know uh, just across the way. uh, Peter lives over on Bainbridge Island. Uh, So we're very close to each other. So it's great. Time zones match up and it makes it very easy. Yeah. Come play. Peter, thank you. I'll come over there. And uh, yeah, (laughs) (laughs) that's great. Thank you so much for your time today, my friend. I appreciate it. Appreciate you, Jeff.